Thank you, Ellie. And thanks for singing. That means a whole lot to hear you uh, just encourage each other with uh, some words along the way. You know, for uh, like 46 years, it seems that a Sunday always comes after the Iowa-Iowa State game. <laughs> and I am always, uh, I guess the expectation is that I'm going to say something about that. I'm just glad I'm not Pastor Ty today. And uh, if you want to know what that means, you come and talk to one of us afterwards. Anyway, uh, I'm retired now. I don't have to give any comments about that game along the way. But we do call this the huddle. I, I know it's football season. Uh, we have a small support group for widows of football uh, season, uh, football season widows. Actually, we don't. Maybe we should start one. But this is the season. And when we get together here, this is the huddle. This is the place where we call the play. And then we go out and then we, we do our mission. We, we perform our mission. We do what we're supposed to do. But when we're in the huddle, sometimes you, you might get a little bored with what is said. You might resonate with what is said. You might understand the, the play call. You might understand the code or you may not understand the code. And I realize that as we gather here today, we are all in different places. And one privilege I have as one of your pastors as I just look around this auditorium is I realize that people have been through some incredible stuff just, just this last week. And realizing that we need each other's prayers and we need to respond to each other in, in music and, and, and encouraging each other that way. I mean, I just, when, when we sing, uh, what a beautiful name, I, I can't... Uh, I can't get through that song without shedding some tears. But the reason is, it's, it's one of the songs, I believe it's one of the songs that we sang the first Sunday we got back together after COVID. And it's like, I realized how much I missed this. And then to focus on the name of Jesus. So, so I realized we're all coming from different places. Some of you got upset stomachs. Some of you got back pains. Some of you have just said some ugly words to other people in your own family. Some of you uh, were late and the rest of you were made late because you were late. Others of you have no idea what's coming up. Some of you are visiting for the first time. You say, what in the world is this uh, place that meets together on Sunday mornings and the parking lot is full and what's that all about? Well, let me, let me help you understand something, even with regard to terminology here. Uh, the Bible has some words it uses for people who are in God's family. These two young ladies this morning just demonstrated their place in God's family. You know what the Bible calls them? It uses all kinds of terms, terms like believer, or Christian, that's a biblical term, or born again, or they're in Christ, or they're brothers and sisters, or it might call them just uh, children of God, or followers of Jesus. Those are all biblical terms which refer to a group of people who have believed in Christ as their savior. We're talking about the gospel. We're talking about the very essence of the gospel. And during this short series, we're, we're being reminded of how important it is for us to reach beyond ourselves and to compel and inspire others to join us as God uses us. We know it's the Holy Spirit who has to make that happen but he uses us to bring them in. And there's plenty for everyone. This is not an exclusive group. We will not run out of food. <laughs> you know, we will not run out of air. God provides, as we just sang, he's, he's good. I, 
I, I, I suppose I would ask this question. By the way, I'm Dan, I'm the old guy here. I guess I'm the great, 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 great grandfather of Mariah, I understand. And uh, uh, we, we were at a wedding last week over in the Chicago area. But um, you know, the question I would ask is this, and I would challenge each one of you on this subject. Are you living in a way that anybody who knows you would want to live like you do? Are you living in, a, in such a way that anyone who watches you would want what you have? I mean, that's one of our desires as Christians is to say, I want to, I want to elevate the, the life that people around me see as the, the contented life because then that might create a bit of discontentment and then they begin to ask questions about, I wonder what he has, I wonder what she has, I wonder what they do, I wonder what is in their world that I would want. And last week, as Ty went to Philippians chapter one, we talked about the whole issue of hope and the fact that, that a lot of people are without hope. I mean, that's, that's kind of our theme for this whole, this whole series. Now, uh, there are two subjects in my life which tend to cause discomfort. One is prayer. And the other is sharing the gospel verbally. I don't really mind living the gospel. I can kind of do that without, you know, opening my mouth. But what about sharing the gospel? So we take prayer and sharing the gospel and those subjects hurt because I'm not doing them well. In fact, I'd suspect you're in my boat. Guess what we get today? Both of them. I wanna encourage you, if you wanna leave now, don't. <laughs> two, two issues first, and, and I wanna clarify this. We have an enemy, we have an enemy. Now, by the way, turn to the person next to you and say, you're not the enemy. Right now, out loud, you're not the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if they don't say it back, then you, you, we're in trouble, okay? <laughs> if you have a face, you're not the enemy. You're not the enemy. Now, I want to have us read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's a fascinating, fascinating text in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, which reminds us about who the enemy really is. So let me just read this. You read it off the screen, okay? The God of this age... The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this age, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, how would you expect Paul to write that? The God of this age has blinded the what of unbelievers? What would you expect? What would you expect to be in that spot? The eyes. But no, he has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The battle we have is for the mind. And the one behind the battle for the mind is Satan. Behind every behavior problem is a belief problem. Every action can be traced to an attitude. And what I want you to understand from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is that people are not the enemy. We're not. Satan is the enemy. People matter to God. And so they matter to us, and it matters not what the nationality, what the race, what the wealth, the, whether they're unborn or old and ready to die or gender issues or political affiliation, they matter to God. We have an enemy, and it's Satan. 
It's Satan. Remember that. Remember that. No person you see this week is the enemy. Not one of them. The problem is Satan has blinded their mind. Now, this is the second issue. And I'll tell you what, by the way, uh, we're going to dive into Colossians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we're not going to put all the words up on the screen uh, of the text. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. I want you to realize, and, and we, we do this all the time, we put it up on the screen so you can follow along, but I want you to dive into whatever you're using uh, as your source for Scripture. If you don't have one, raise your hand. These guys will give you one, okay? And if you don't have one, I mean, you really don't have one, take it. This is yours. Make sure you have one. But there's a second issue along with identifying the enemy because if we have a mission, I want to know who's the enemy? What's the problem here? The problem is that Satan has blinded our minds. Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. But there's a second issue, and that is we all have a personal problem. And our personal problem is that we're born with a default condition called let me just be more specific, selfishness. It's not just sin, it's selfishness. I mean, it really is all about us. And you know that when these little babies are born, all of a sudden there's this demand coming from them. For some reason, they know how to complain. They know how to get our attention. And so we need to feed them. We need to care for them. We need to change them. We need to make sure they sleep. We need to make sure that they are free from all other kinds of ailments along the way because it's all about them. And we never grow out of that. We tend to work harder at making it about others, but ultimately our default condition is that it becomes about us. Now, now we need, okay, I'm sorry. This is the beginning of the school year. So let's get into the school year a little bit, okay? <clears throat> a little bit of science. <clears throat> for those who are, are into science and engineering and so on, you know I've made reference to this every so often over the years. In science, in <clears throat> heat transfer and so on, there's a law called the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics. Now, the first law says that there's a conservation of matter and energy and there's a bunch of stuff, okay. Second law, and I'm gonna put this in, in my own version, okay, it says, this is a law. Doesn't matter whether Congress passes it or not. It's a law, all right? Without outside intelligent input, stuff decays. It dies. There's a fancier way of saying it, and so you, you who are into this world, you, you understand that, okay? But in a, in a system, unless you have intelligent regular outside input, stuff will die. Unfortunately, my friends who, uh, you know, believe in the whole evolutionary theory tend to wipe this law out and say that law just doesn't apply to origins. I say, well, yeah, it does. And in fact, that outside intelligent input is God, intelligent design all over the place. Now let's take this law and let's transfer it to the huddle, this huddle here. And, and I wanna call it the second law of theodynamics. Okay, just change it just a little bit. The second law of theodynamics <clears throat> says <clears throat> that without regular intelligent outside input, this church will tend to, tend to focus on itself and it'll be all about us all about us. <clears throat> I was at a wedding rehearsal dinner just last week and made friends with a, a grandfather. And we talked about church. He said, when he found out what I, what I did, he said, is your church dying? He said, ours is. So we dove into that a little bit more and just said, well, listen, what, is, it, is it about you? Is it, is it about the people who are there and, and nobody else? Well, we will tend 
to follow the second law of theodynamics, which says unless we have regular, intelligent input from the outside, we will tend to focus on ourselves and we will decay and we will die. I mean, I'm I'm not talking about spiritual life here, okay? I'm just talking about our mission. We will tend to lose focus. So we need this series, I need this series every so often just to help me realize, yeah, a lot of what we do here is to encourage each other and to spur each other on to good works and good deeds and and to challenge each other and to discipline each other and to be involved in discipleship. But we cannot forget that a major part of our mission is to live for those who are outside this huddle. Now turn to Colossians, Colossians. It's a little tiny book. Might have actually gone on a couple of pages in Paul's day. The book of Colossians, you've got uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, Find Colossians chapter four. We're gonna dive into this and I want you to, I want you to see, I want you to see the words. Because in this particular passage, Paul gives us some clear instruction. He doesn't simply say, hey, listen, I'm gonna give you some optional things to do. I'm gonna give you some, some, some possible activities to participate in. He's saying, you need to do this. This is a command. And by the way, friends, commands from the apostle Paul are just as legitimate as commands from Jesus Christ himself. So we need to pay attention. And here's what he says. Colossians chapter four, verse two. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And be wise in the way you act toward outsiders making the most of every opportunity and let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, when you're studying, and we'll stop right there. That's enough, okay? That's enough. When you're studying a passage of scripture, one of the things you can do is you study a passage of scripture is to go back through the verses and figure out which words are recurring, which, which words are repeated. And when you go through this particular text, you'll find out that the word prayer is, is repeated three times. It's in there three times. And then you have the word uh, proclaim, which is in there twice. And then it talks about conversation and it talks about answering. Those are, those are speech kinds of words. So you've got prayer, that's a theme of this text. And you've got speech, which is another theme of this text. And the two are sort of like bound at the hip. And those are the two issues that I find extremely difficult to wrestle with in my own life because I'm not satisfied with either one. Which means perhaps this text is written for me as much as it is for you. And Paul starts off by saying, devote yourselves to prayer. Prayer, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Prayer is a big deal. I gotta share just a word of encouragement with you. The summer has been a bit crazy in our world for Lee and me. And uh, we've been to weddings and we've been to funerals and we've been to receptions and just a variety of events along the way. And every so often, every so often, someone will come up to me and say, Dan, I am so grateful for Calvary Church in Muscatine because they reached out to my family, because they reached out to my daughter, because they reached out to my parents. And I have to tell you that in that moment, my heart just sort of melts and I say, what a great group of people we have who are the answers to someone else's prayers. Now we're gonna dive into that a little bit more during community hour and, and I'd urge you, you know, hit the other end of the hallway, take a little walk, 
uh, get rid of the coffee. Uh, well, stop in the restroom to get rid of the coffee, but nonetheless, uh, when you get to the other end, there's some snacks down there, and we're starting a, a brand new uh, study on the, just the subject of prayer. Don't, do not stay away. D do not stay, that's not the thing to do, just because it's a difficult subject. You know, um, again, something that grips my heart is I show up here on a Sunday morning and not only is the worship team and the, the crew rehearsing a bit, going through some stuff, but there are a group of people all over this facility early on Sunday mornings who are praying for what goes on in here, in Calvary Kids, in the Family Life Center. And you know what? They don't make a big splash of it. They don't say, how come, how come nobody announces this thing? You know, we, we'd like to have more. Well, certainly they would love to have more, but what a, what a delightful thing to come onto campus and realize there are people already praying for what happens here on Sunday morning. And you know what? Maybe they prayed for you. I know they prayed for me. He needs it, you know. But they prayed for you. Prayer. Then there's another word here. It says in verse two, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. If your name is Gregory, that's the word for watchful. It really is. I'm serious. Alert. He's a Gregory. He's alert. Watchful, thankful. You know what thankfulness does? Thankfulness helps this selfish tendency of prayer to focus on us. You know, when we give thanks, we realize that, that we are not responsible for it ourselves. We are dependent upon others. Gratitude. And then Paul says, I want you to, I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for me. Last week, Ty described Paul's situation in Philippians chapter one. Well, it turns out that Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon from prison in Rome. And so he's in chains. He has some uh, freedom apparently. You know, he can write some stuff. He can entertain visitors along the way. But Paul says, right now, where I am, do, you know what he's, he's not saying? Pray that I'll be released from my chains. Pray that the judge will rule favorably and I'll get out of here. No, what he says is, I want you to pray that God will use me right where I am. And we are all waiting for better circumstances. I want better circumstances before I share the gospel. I want the occasion to be exactly right, just uh, uh, the way it's supposed to be before I share the gospel. And Paul's saying, no, I want to be able to share the gospel right here, right now, right in my circumstances, difficult though they may be. And the apostle Paul, by the way, did not wait for good circumstances or religious uh, contexts to share the gospel. He shared the gospel when things were difficult. He shared the gospel in public places. He shared the gospel in response to a riot. He shared the gospel with the judge in court. He shared the gospel in the middle of disasters. Ty referred to this last week, shipwrecks, snake bites. Pray for opportunities. Are you asking God for opportunities? And then he uses the word uh, clarity, verse uh, four. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, clearly. Folks, we need to get the gospel right. It's for all, even those who may seem farthest from God, but we need to get it right. Now, Okay, I see the director is waving at me. It's time for a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm gonna give you a little ad, okay? I don't know if you've been here on Wednesday nights. It's a zoo, love it. We call it family night, okay? And uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of people on this campus and they range from 
you know, old folks like me to young kids that I trip over and can run faster than I can even think. And there are all kinds of opportunities available from Awana to, to middle school events, breakaway to you know, just a, a variety of things for adults. Women have ministries, uh, men have ministries with their sons and a variety of issues along the way. We have a class for uh, all, all ages, all genders and so on uh, that meets across the, the commons at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. And there are some tables out in the commons that have information about what goes on on Wednesday nights. I can't make it from Sunday to Sunday on my own. This is not enough. So I encourage you, check it out, try something, you know, and uh, come at 6.30 on Wednesday night. Now watch out for traffic. It, it's, it's busy. It's busy at about 6.15 on Wednesday nights. Plan to come out for family night, okay? Now, back to our regularly scheduled, scheduled programming. <clears throat> Look at verse uh, 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Be wise. Do you know that in Paul's day, Christians were marginalized? You know, we here, even though there are pockets and so on of Christians being marginalized, we here in the West typically are not marginalized. In other words, we're not shoved into the edges. But it may be coming. It may be coming. And you know what? we might be better off in the intensity with which we share the gospel if we find ourselves in the corners of culture. I don't want it to be that way. Be wise. And then in verse five, Paul says, actually it's in verse six, he says, let your conversation be full of grace which means it's not abusive. We're talking about your speech for others as you share with them truth, the truth of God, the truth of the gospel. Don't be abusive. Do not be vindictive. I I love it. I love it in my carnal nature when those who have been my enemies bite the dust. Those humans who have been my enemies, bite the dust, and it's sort of like, you know, they deserved it. And then I realized, now wait a minute. If you got what you deserved, you'd be forever lost with grace. And then the phrase that that provides a little bit of a a picture, a, a metaphor, let your conversation be seasoned with, what's it say? Salt, salt. We're not talking about, in the Navy sense, salty speech, okay? <laughs> Sorry for you guys who are in the Navy, but we, we all know what that is. Seasoned with salt. You know, salt does three things. Salt, number one, it, it, it's, it's a preservative. It, 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 it preserves things. Secondly, salt also is an antiseptic. It, 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 can, it, can kill, it can kill disease. It can kill infections. It can sterilize. We're not talking about either one of those. We're talking about the third use of salt, which is it's a season. It's a seasoning. And, and you add salt to make something taste better. It might even create a desire for more. You know, I think about the way Jesus responded to people in his world. And we've just come out of this series in the book of John. I'm kind of anxious to get back into it, but that won't happen until the first of the year. Notice the people with whom Jesus interacted and how he, his conversation was seasoned with salt. Nicodemus an uppity-up Jewish leader. Jesus, Jesus approached him one way. He was willing to meet with him at night. 
He accommodated himself to the fears that Nicodemus had. And, and, and then he met with the woman at the well and treated her totally differently than he would have Nicodemus. And then there was the cripple next to the pool. And then there was the woman who was caught in bed with a man who was not her husband. And then there were these religious, you know, Sadducees and Pharisees, and we tend to want to hate the religious people. But Jesus was using a very confrontational sort of, uh, I I guess he was anxious to shock them out of their self-righteousness because guess what? He loved them too. Your conversation seasoned with salt. In our world today, um, and, and I guess I would, uh, I would suggest that in our world today we have different issues than we did maybe when I was a kid. It has to do with identity. You might need to bring that up in a conversation with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Ask them questions about who they believe they are. I mean, we're in a world today where kids are being told it's all up to you. You just can be whatever you want to be. And so we find these students just trapped in this cocoon which says, it's all up to me, it's all within me. I guess I need to, I, I need to make something for myself and, and I have to help them realize somewhere along the way, no, there's a lot that's beyond you. It's not up to you. You've got help. You've got direction. You've got creativity. You've got forethought into your design. Sometimes you need to talk to people. I know it's time to quit. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, would you stop doing that? I wish. <laughs> All right, time to take the medicine. <laughs> Hope, people are without hope. People people think to a great extent, they think that what I see is all there is. There is nothing beyond this right here. So I need to manage my world just as much as I can. Talk about purpose, talk about loneliness. You know, I, I guess I would put it this way. We as Christians, and I'm going to assume that most of us in this room are Christians, we're, we're in that family of God category. We're, we're the insider group. Paul calls some of them outsiders, okay? I understand that. that th- th- those are the ones whose faith yet is not, is not yet in the person of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, Okay. Those of us who are in that Christian category, that follower of Jesus, that disciple category, we need to learn two languages. The first language is prayer. Talked about that already. That has to do with our relationship with God. And then we also need to learn the language of those who are without Christ, which is the language of our culture. And let me put it simply this way. It's the language of attention. Attention. I need attention. I want somebody to pay attention to me. And we as Christians need to learn that language as we relate to those people who are not yet in Christ. There's a phrase, I don't practice it very well, but but I know it. Being heard is so close to being loved that most people can't tell the difference. You catch that? Now, if you do, go like this. If you don't, go like this. Okay, that really helps a lot, okay? (laughs) The lights aren't that bright. I can see you. Some of you are nodding off. (laughs) Being heard is so close to being loved 
that most people can't tell the difference. And you know, our method in reaching people who are without Jesus might precisely fall into the category of, I guess I need to listen. Ask questions, listen. The conversation eventually comes around to the reason of our hope. And that's why I wanna go back to our key verse for this series. It's 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter three and verse 15. If we can put that up on the screen. It goes like this. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. May I say a word to, um, to my generation? <clears throat> Those who have had gray hair showing up for several years now and pretty much it's all gray or it's gone. We, Lee and I are going out to a reunion in Ames to celebrate the football game. Uh, uh, from, yeah, no. <laughs> this is set up quite a while ago. Our church campus group has been away from campus now for 50 years. So we're having a reunion. I don't know, probably, I, I feel like I got a tiger by the tail because all kinds of people are showing up from all over the United States. And we're all old. And we have lots to say. And I also realize that sometimes we are so frustrated with this world that we have packed our bags for the next. You have from today till the last day of this life on earth to be salt and light. We'll learn about light next week, okay? And for those of you who are my age, go for broke. I mean, you're not a threat. You are not a threat to anybody. People look at me and think, boy, if I taunt him, he'll hit me. I can't hit anybody. I can't hit anybody. I'll break my hand. And I can't run away. I can't run. So I'm not a threat to anybody. So I can say anything I want to anybody and people will just say, well, he has no filter. You know, he's old. Go for it. Those of you who are my age, you probably have some discretionary time. Ty talked last week about the fact that you know, he, he goes into the grocery store looking for people he can converse with. I go into the grocery store thinking, I don't want to go down that aisle because so-and-so's down that aisle. I don't want to go down that aisle. That's the way it used to be for me. I, seriously, it was. I, I, I hated to shop. I hated to get groceries. I'll see somebody I know, they'll want to talk. <laughs> That's not true anymore. I have some discretionary time. But make sure, Dan, that you listen more than you talk. There's some people here who are part of that outside intelligent input that has to come into my life to remind me that it's not about me. It's not about me. I need to keep reaching out, keep reaching out. So several are, are here today. I'm gonna to take the risk of naming some. Diane Thiering. Tom Norton. Matt Rivera. Don Orvis. Just hang around those guys and I realize you know, I can live a godly life, but I need to speak something of the gospel. When those folks don't give me enough input, I go to the radio and listen to guys like Greg Laurie. Just his heart is so burdened 
for the lost. It is part of God's plan for us who are eternally secure. It's part of God's plan for us who are eternally secure to make sacrifices for and invest in those who are eternally lost. Did you get that? It is part of God's plan for us who are eternally secure. I am. I am. The Bible says I am. You are. If you're in Christ, you're in Christ forever. He's got you. It's God's plan for us who are eternally secure to make sacrifices for and invest in those who are eternally lost. You know, I was reading a book about surrender. I hate books on surrender. I hate chapters on surrender. And then I, then I don't know if it was the devil or God or the Holy Spirit or whatever, took me to the sign that's on the outside of the FLC on the other end, our little, sort of our little catchphrase during this season, you know, live to love. And I thought, oh, maybe it's Die. To love. Die in order to love. That probably wouldn't go so well in terms of the community outreach that we do along the way. But you understand what I mean? Reaching those who have no idea that there's a place of eternal condemnation, which is something we've forgotten about recently. We have tended to minimize the blessings of heaven and sort of, you know, sort of uh, gloss over the terrors of hell where there is eternal condemnation, where there is eternal judgment, a place of no creativity, a place of no light, a place of no warmth, a place of no companionship, a place of total loss. We have forgotten that those without Christ will be there. And so what we've done is we've sort of moderated the gospel by suggesting that there is a, well, people go out of existence when they die, or maybe there'll be a second chance somewhere along the way, or maybe the sincerity of their heart is good enough and they don't need to really believe in Jesus, which is all contrary to scripture. Jonah. You know the story of Jonah. It's all about the whale. No, it's not. It's all about a plant under which Jonah sat to protect himself from the intense heat of the desert. Turns out that Jonah was more concerned about the outcome of the Iowa-Iowa State game. (laughs) No, that's not true. I just, it came up than he was about 120,000 people in the walls of Nineveh who didn't know who God was. Turns out God shriveled the plant and now Noah's, or Jonah's hot. And God says, now wait a minute. That's not what's most important. Paul said this, Romans chapter 10, I love this verse, he said, Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call on him in whom they don't believe? And how will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless somebody tells them? It's our job. Go do it with salt. Lord, I, 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 my toes have been hit again. And um, I'm, how much do I pray for opportunities to speak the gospel to those around me, knowing full well that the vast majority still need to know who Jesus is. And these baptisms this morning demonstrate that gospel. It's a picture of the gospel, the death and the burial of Jesus, the very root of it all, the fact that he died in our place. God, convince us 
of the need to practice that kind of behavior in our world as we become your mouthpieces with salt. Thank you. Amen. Would you stand, please?